Hello, everybody. My name is Stephanie. Uh, I run platform ads and games on the product side. How are, we guys, how are we doing? We are second to last session. Are we feeling energized? Yes? All right. Are you ready to learn best practices on how to build your app and business using Facebook? Are you ready? Okay, the energy levels are low. We need to get some, some soda in here or something. Great, so um, we have Claire from the product side and Steven on the Eng side who are gonna talk to you about these best practices. So welcome, Claire. Thank you, Stephanie. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. I'm a product manager for developer tools and experiences. My co-speaker today, Steven, he's the engineering manager for Graph API. At Facebook, my job is to ensure our developers like yourself have a great experience using our products and technology. So as part of my job, I regularly speak to developers around the world. I enjoy hearing their stories about how they're using our technology to build their business. I enjoy hearing their tips and tricks and some of their challenges as well. So that's why today, Steven and I pulled together this talk about best practices for integrating with Facebook. So we're going to cover three topics today. First, we're going to talk about mindset. Everything starts with the mind. And uh, I'll talk about how to expand your mindset so that you can better understand Facebook technologies. And then Stephen will go a little bit deeper into the development process and talk about the best practices during those, process, uh, during those steps. And in the end, I'll talk about how you can get those best practices in your local community. So let's get started. First, mindset. In the past 10 years, Facebook has introduced many developer technologies for the community. What's shown on the screen here is just a subset of those technologies that we rolled out to the community. I want to get a sense from the audience how many of you are using at least one product on the screen in your business? At least one. Raise your hand. Almost everybody. You are at the right conference. What about, what about two products? Still almost in the entire room. What about three? Maybe two-thirds of the room? What about four? Maybe one-third of the room. What about five? Maybe a handful. Thank you. Thank you for participating. The reason I ask this question is that we know that a lot of the companies know how to use one or two Facebook products uh, from our platform. But not a lot of companies know how to truly make Facebook platform an integral part of your product strategy. So Facebook technologies are just like a bunch of building blocks. How do you decide which piece to use and how best to integrate into your product strategy? If you're a developer, you're often concerned with a bunch of how-to questions. How do I get the latest SDK? Or how do I make the API call? Or how do I get this access token to work? So a bunch of how-to questions to get the technologies working together. But if you are a founder of a company, I bet some of you in the audience are founders or business owners of your company. Anybody? Yes. So if you are founders in your company, then you will be concerned with a different set of questions. The what and why questions. What can you build with all the technologies out there? And what would your business look like in two to three years? And why do your customers behave the way they do? So those what and why questions is the key difference between the founder's mindset versus a developer's mindset. If you are a developer, it's very important for you to expand your mindset so that you can better understand Facebook technology. Why is that? If we take a step back and look at Facebook platform as a whole, our mission is to help businesses make meaningful connections with their customers. And that is the guiding post for us to decide which technologies we're going to bring to market. And that also helps us decide what investment we're going to make in the future. 
So if you're also constantly thinking about how to make connections with your customer, how you build your business from your customer base, then you will be able to better understand Facebook platform as a whole and how to integrate Facebook technologies into your product. If you look at this quote from VP of Growth at Top Hatter, Top Hatter is a live auction site. And what Ragnar highlights in his quote is a gap in his company. The developers in his company doesn't spend enough time thinking about growth opportunities. I know he's not alone. Many companies, as soon as you grow to a size that uh, allows you to have two different teams, a business team or a product team versus an engineering team, you start to have the siloed thinking. And because of that, you may be missing opportunities. That's why it's important for the developers to expand your mindset, to also think about business growth. So how do you expand your mindset and think like a founder? I'm going to talk about a simple framework that you can use to think about business growth. And with the very same framework, you can also use that to think about all the Facebook technologies that we introduce to developer community. So to make it fun, we will use a made up example. And we'll use this example throughout the talk. Steven and I are both food lovers. And, but we're very busy working for Facebook. We don't have time to cook. And we know a lot of people share the same challenges as us. So we built a business called Yum Fresh. And Yum Fresh delivers freshly cooked local meals, lunch or dinner to your table. Our customers can order their meals through app or website or even a messenger bot. So first thing first, in order to build our business, um, the first thing we need to do is to get our names out there and acquire some customers. We may run some ads, like Facebook ads or other online ads. We may run some local print ads. The goal is to acquire our customers. That's the first stage, acquisition. As soon as we have a single customer, what we need to worry about is how do we make sure this customer have a great experience, and how do we bring that customer again and again? Not just once, not just twice, but multiple times a month or even multiple times a week. So that is customer retention. And once we build a healthy, growing customer base, then we need to worry about monetization. We need to worry about our revenue growth, our margin growth. At the end of the day, that's what our investors care about, and that's what measures the business success. So this very simple framework, acquisition, retention, monetization, that is a you know, very typical three-stage growth framework for a lot of businesses. If it doesn't apply to your business, some variation of it, well. So to keep this discussion simple, we'll just use this three-stage growth framework. So now let's dive into acquisition. So in the first month, Steven and I saw some, you know, pretty healthy growth. Our customers grew linearly. You know, we're kind of happy, but our investors are not happy. They're looking for even faster exponential growth. So in order to get exponential growth, we have to build some viral growth strategy into our plan. How do we do that? We know that when it comes to food choices, a lot of people go with their friends and family's recommendation. So we, we introduced this feature that allow our users to share uh, a coupon from us on their Facebook um, timeline. So now one customer can bring multiple customers. And this you know, new customer that, that just brought in can also bring additional customers. So in a month's time, we start to see this strategy working. So our Customer growth curve is starting to bend upwards, growing at a much faster pace. And uh, you know, now let's just quick, quickly take a look at the Facebook technologies that we have to help you acquire customers. 
Everybody knows ads, so I don't need to talk about ads. One thing I want to just point out that we have a special format of ads called app ads. With app ads, you can, our, your users, when click on this ads, can directly install the app from the ads. The user doesn't need to go to the app store and then um, go install your app. Because it shortens the conversion funnel, it increases the conversion rate. You can also run the ads programmatically using our marketing API. In addition to running ads, it's also important to grow your audience organically. So we have Facebook sharing, um, like the example we've shown in YumFresh. We also have app invites. This let our users to invite their friends into their app experience. And once you have all these interested users coming to your app or your website, the next critical thing to do is to capture your audience right there. That comes the account creation. We have Facebook login and account kit. Both are passwordless login solutions. Facebook login was introduced about nine years ago. Account kit was introduced at FA last year. We've seen tremendous adoption for both of these two products. Our top partners have seen up to 90% conversion rate using these two login products. So now let's continue with the Yum Fresh story. Look at retention. So we talked about in the first two months, our total users have grown pretty rapidly. And we have a problem with our monthly active users. As you can see, our monthly active users hasn't caught up with the growth. It's been dragging its feet. So what's telling us is that our new users that we acquire, they don't always come back. So what do we do? We looked into the data. We saw that two thirds of the coupons expire without being used. So we need a way to remind our users to use the coupon. So we used Facebook push notification to send our users a push when a coupon is about to expire. So now, with the visual cue of the coupon, our users get the reminder and remembers to use YumFresh again. So over time, this starts to form a habit for our user to come to YumFresh when they are about to order food. So in another month, as you can expect, our active users are catching up and growing at a much faster pace. So quickly talk about our products for re retention. Push notification, as you already seen um, in the example. Another very important product for user retention is Messenger Platform. You've heard quite a lot about Messenger Platform in our keynote today. So Steven, when he comes up on stage, he will also talk about how we use a Messenger bot and use that to engage with our users at the right time. The last thing I'll touch on in terms of user retention is our page API. Many businesses and organizations have Facebook page as their social presence. And we have an API that allows you to send communication uh, on behalf of the page and manage the user engagement programmatically. So the last stage, monetization. In the growth journey of YumFresh, for the first three months, as we we're growing our users, we're digging a deeper hole into our pocket. Because we are using all of those coupons, we're subsidizing our growth. So by the end of month three, we have a negative 10% growth margin. And we don't want to abandon the coupon because that's a very important part of our growth strategy. What do we do? Can we have a different revenue stream or, or you know, additional revenue stream? So we decided to integrate with Facebook Audience Network. Audience Network allow us to run ads in our app as well as our website and we cleverly insert the ads at the end of the order um, completion. So with that, in another three months, we turn our margin from negative 10% to positive 10%. So Steven and I are really happy and our investors are super happy. 
So for monetization, we talk about audience network. That's our key product for helping our developers to monetize. And if you're a game developer, you can also get game payments through in-app purchases. That's also another very important monetization mechanism. So we talked about acquisition, retention, monetization as a very simple growth framework and how Facebook products map to this growth framework. There's one thing I haven't talked about. There's one Facebook technology that cuts across all of these stages, which is Facebook Analytics. Facebook Analytics allow you to view customer behavior across the entire customer journey, across different channels, including websites, mobile app, Facebook page, and Messenger platform. And we will be integrating more in the future. And it also allows you to track a user behavior across multiple devices, whether a user is on their phone, or iPad, or desktop. So basically, you get a very unified view of, a, of the user across multiple channels and multiple devices. So with that framework, you can expand your mindset to think about how to drive business growth and how to integrate with Facebook to achieve your objective. And uh, now I want to use a real example. We talked about YumFresh. Now it's time to use a real example. Uh, this is a business called Music Match. I bet some of you in the audience have used Music Match. It's the world's largest lyrics platform. It plays lyrics as you play the music on Spotify or Apple Music or uh, YouTube. It was founded in 2000. And to this day, it has more than 30 million users and millions of lyrics contributed and translated by its community. So how did they achieve that growth? So let's look at these three stage framework. For acquisition, they use Facebook login. And today, Facebook login accounts for about 75% of their users. Once the user signs in with Facebook login, they can customize that experience. For retention, they use Facebook analytics extensively. Previously, I said Facebook analytics can be used for all stages. And here, I just want to deep dive into how they use Facebook analytics for retention. They create a custom segment called most 10% active users who close ads. They basically looked at the top of their user engagement. At the very top, those users who close ads are the best segment to target for premium subscription. So they created that user segment and used the very segment to target for a Facebook ads as well as push notification campaign. So by combining multiple Facebook technologies together, they can very efficiently target their users for more engagement. For monetization, they integrated with Facebook audience network about a year ago. So users can see an ad occasionally as they, as they are seeing the lyrics being played. So today, the, re, uh, the ads revenue accounts for about 50% of their revenue stream. So very significant number. So now, with the story of YumFresh and Music Match, you can see Facebook technologies are just tools to help you achieve these business objectives, to acquire users, to retain users, and to drive monetization. All right, so I hope you can take this framework and use it in your daily uh, work to think about your business, to think about your business growth, and how to integrate with Facebook technologies to drive your business. So next, I'll bring up Stephen, who will talk about best practices during your development stage. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you, Claire. So my name is Stephen, and I'm the engineering manager for the Graph API, which I've been working on here at Facebook for the past five years. As Claire said, I'm going to do a deeper dive into the development process of building an app or other product. Specifically, I'm going to talk about integrating with our SDKs, 
building with Facebook login. Some tips for calling the Graph API, and I'll wrap up with some updates on bug reporting. And I'd like to talk about all of these things by revisiting this YumFresh example. So we'll walk through the journey of building out this YumFresh app and various experiences with it. And what better place to start with this than with the SDK? So we offer developers three different SDKs. The first is the Facebook SDK, which supports things like the Graph API, analytics, sharing, and login. We also have the Account Kit SDK. As Claire mentioned earlier, Account Kit is another one of our identity products, and it allows people to sign in to your app using a phone number or an email address. This can be used in place of or even alongside Facebook login. And the third is the Audience Network SDK, which Claire also touched on. This lets you show third-party apps within your uh, third-party ads within your app, and can be another source of revenue. All of these SDKs support iOS and Android, as well as a couple other languages. And if you don't see the language of your choice up here, there might even be a third-party SDK that's been built out for it. And we include links to some of those third-party SDKs on the docs on our developer site. Earlier today, we released version 4.22 of the Facebook SDK. And as you can see, we've been releasing updates to this SDK approximately once every month. With updates that happen this frequently, you might be asking yourself, how can I always keep up to date and make sure I'm getting the latest version and access to our newest products and features? Well, that brings us to our first best practice. We recommend that you use dependency management tools like CocoaPods if you're building an iOS app, or Maven if you're building an Android app. These let you specify a dependency on our SDK, and then any time that we publish a new version, they'll go ahead and download the update for you. So you'll never have to worry about that ever again. And another important thing to keep in mind as you're building your app is the total size. This can be important in certain markets, or if based on in some of your users, if they might be a little more conscious of how much data they use when downloading apps. So I'd also like to talk about a couple things that you can do to limit the impact of our SDKs on your app's total size. The first thing to note is that our SDKs are built for a truly global audience, and they come with support for over 45 different languages. But maybe you don't need all of those languages. YumFresh, for example, might only operate in one country, might only need a single language. And so with just a couple lines of configuration in our SDK code like this, you can limit how many languages get included in that final version of your app. The Facebook SDK also comes in three different kits. There's the core kit, which supports staples like the Graph API and analytics. There's the share kit, which you'll use if you're enabling sharing from your app back to Facebook. And there's the login kit, if you're building with Facebook login. Now, YumFresh is going to use all three of these, but if you don't need all of them, you don't have to include all of them either. And finally, there are third-party tools out there, such as ProGuard if you're building an Android app. ProGuard is a Java code optimizer that can find and remove unused methods and classes, and it'll help you shrink that final size of your app. So let's look at applying these all in practice. We took all of our SDKs and look at a sample app on each of them. This shows the relative sizes of those apps. And then we ran ProGuard on them and restricted each of them to only include a single language of our SDKs. And as you can see, those sizes can shrink dramatically. In the case of the Facebook SDK, for instance, just these two optimizations alone account for over 70% of that reduction. Now that we have the bones of our app in place with our SDKs, it's time to start thinking about some of the first Facebook products that we're going to integrate with it. And the first one we'll look at is Facebook login. 
Now, Facebook login allows people to bring the information from their Facebook account right into your app. And with just a few taps, they can jump in. You don't have to worry about building your own account management system or figuring out how to securely store passwords. As this is one of the first things that your users will see when they open your app, it's really important to leave them with a good impression. That's why we recommend that you limit how much information you request on that initial login. The fewer permissions that you're asking for, the more likely they are to complete that login. And that's also why we're announcing a brand new login flow for Android if you only request basic information and email address. In that case, once that user taps the sign in button, they'll see a dialog that looks like this and they'll never switch out of your app. And with just one more tap, they're brought right in and can start using it. Now, you might want to ask for other permissions, in which case we recommend that you do so later on and only in the context in which they'll be used. So for example, we might build out a rewards program in, in YumFresh. Let's say we want to give people a coupon whenever it's their birthday. Well, once that user taps on that, only then should we present them with the option to grant their birthday. And if they decline, we don't want to keep pestering them or block other functionality within the app. Instead, we could provide more information, let them know what they'll get out of providing their birthday. And in that case, they're much more likely to go along with it. Another experience that I want to talk about building is a messenger bot. So let's say Claire and I are working late over Messenger one night. We're getting hungry. We want to order some food. Then right from that bot, uh, right from that chat thread, we can open up the bot and place our order. So to power something like this, we'll need to build a companion server-side application that integrates with our Messenger bot product. And one of the steps of setting this bot up is authorizing it to send messages on behalf of the YumFresh Facebook page. Now Claire, as the manager of our Facebook page, will have to grant the bot some permissions. And so she'll see a login flow that looks something like this. Starting today, however, she'll see a brand new flow that we've built out to optimize for page and other management related permissions. So she can go and review the information that she provides. And she'll now be able to see all of the pages that are included with this permission. She doesn't want to bring along all of her pages. She now has the option to uncheck any that don't apply. In this case, all she cares about is the YumFresh page. This gives Claire peace of mind and greater trust in the app. She won't have to worry about it sending messages on behalf of any other pages that she doesn't intend to. And the best part about this is this new flow is completely transparent to the app. You won't have to make a single code or configuration change to work with it. Now, I'd like to wrap up our discussion of login with some tips on how you can secure your app's use of it. Everything that I'll mention here, as well as some more, you can find in our security checklist at developers.facebook.com. The first thing to note is you should always use our official SDKs whenever possible. When you use Facebook login through our SDKs, they'll handle the nuts and bolts of that login process for you and also manage your access tokens. If you visit your app settings, one of the things you'll find there is what we call an app secret. This is known only to developers, developers of your app as well as to Facebook. You can use the secret from your own server to make certain types of API requests, but you should never include this secret in any mobile or client-side code where it could be decompiled or compromised. If you have a mobile app, but you make API calls from your server, and to do so, you send up user access tokens from your app, then you should be using our token debugging API to verify that the tokens your server receives really do belong to your app. This will prevent anyone else from passing up tokens that you don't expect. And in fact, if all of your calls are made from the server in this way, 
We even have a setting that you can enable to require that these calls are made with what we call an app secret proof. This proof is just a hash computed from the access token and your app secret. And so it verifies that these requests really do come from your server. This will prevent anyone else from using your access tokens to do anything that you didn't intend to happen. There are a number of settings that you'll find on your app dashboard. And you should check this out and verify that you're relying on anything that is currently enabled. If you find something you don't need, we recommend you disable it just to help minimize your app's exposure to risk. Now, the, the last topic relevant to building our YumFresh app is the Graph API. The Graph API allows developers to integrate with Facebook and its family of apps. And it includes everything from managing a page and running ads for it to uploading live videos and even running that messenger bot that I spoke of. To give you a sense of scale, the Graph API handles an average of 1.2 trillion requests every single day. Much of that traffic actually comes from our own mobile apps. Just like all of the apps you're building, we also run on top of the Graph API. So its efficiency and stability matters a lot to us too. This morning, we announced version 2.9 of the Graph API. And there's a lot that's new with version 2.9. So you should check out our change log for a complete list. But I'm going to briefly touch on two updates that are going to be relevant to YumFresh. The first of these is the launch of the Places Graph. The Places Graph enables mobile developers to enhance their apps with location services by giving them access to over 140 million places on Facebook for free. This is built into our SDKs, which is yet another reason to be using them. So some examples of things you can do with the Places Graph include searching and filtering for nearby places, predicting where somebody currently is, and even geotagging photos or videos. This was covered in more detail in a session earlier today, specifically on the Places Graph, so if you missed that and you want to learn more, you should definitely check out our recording of that session. So how might YumFresh use this? Well, quite naturally, we might want to just search for restaurants nearby. We can do things like filter by specific food types or sort those results by proximity to us and even set a delivery location. And the Places Graph powers all of this. The second new update that I'll talk about is a brand new API we've built for login-based apps with their own messenger bot, just like ours here. This new API lets you more easily engage with your customers across these two channels and allowing, allows you to associate customers that have both logged into your app as well as messaged your page. And with this API, we can more seamlessly integrate these two experiences and do things like apply a coupon that's held in your app to an order that gets placed via our messenger bot. Now, there's one more scenario I'd like to consider building. Let's say we're interested in knowing whenever one of our customers uploads a photo to Facebook with the hashtag YumFresh. How might we build something like this? Well, the simplest thing to do you suggest repeatedly query the Graph API and just ask if there are any new photos that match this criteria. But much like a little kid in a long car ride that keeps asking, are we there yet, are we there yet, most of the time Facebook doesn't have anything new to report. This is also inefficient and you're much more likely to hit your API rate limits this way. So we can do better. Apps that have a server-side component can use webhooks. With webhooks, we can subscribe to our customers' photo uploads, and then whenever somebody does that, Facebook will send a request to our server. And that request will contain relevant information like the photo ID. So if we need any additional info, we can make a separate Graph API request at that point to pull more. And in fact, building messenger bots, as we've done here, requires the adoption of webhooks. Any messages that get sent to your page will be sent to your application server as webhooks updates. 
And beginning today, we are announcing a number of improvements to webhooks, which you can find by going to the webhooks product section of your app dashboard. This is where you can subscribe to individual fields that you care about, such as photos. And we're also announcing support for versioning in webhooks. This will allow us to introduce new features in a safe manner that your app will be able to opt into at its leisure. These webhooks versions will match the Graph API versions, and they'll have the same two-year lifespan. You can specify the version for any field in your subscription, and your subscription can support multiple versions at once if you're subscribed to multiple fields. We've also created the ability to send sample updates. This will let you trigger specific updates so you can test them on your server during development. And if payloads ever change in a future webhooks version, this will allow you to test receiving that new payload before you switch over which one your server gets in production. If you'd like to learn more about webhooks, you can check out our newly revamped docs on it at developers.facebook.com. <clears throat> Lastly, I'd like to talk about some ways to optimize your Graph API requests. And let's consider the example of just wanting to query for new posts on the YumFresh page. This API request has a response that looks something like this. There's a lot of information here, but we don't necessarily need all of this. So we can actually use the field expansion functionality of the Graph API to improve this performance. By specifying a fields parameter, we can indicate which fields we actually care about. In this case, we're asking for the author of the post and any attachments that are included on it. Doing this has a number of benefits. First, we'll get that response much faster, since Facebook won't have to go and compute any of those other fields. Second, that response will be a lot smaller, which can be especially important for mobile apps that might have to operate under weaker network conditions. And lastly, Specifying fields in this manner is required in more places from version 2.4 and onward. So if your app is still on version 2.3 and you're looking to upgrade, you'll definitely want to make sure you're checking out this optimization. Field expansion also supports arbitrary nesting. So we can do more complicated things like ask for the author's name and profile picture, or ask for any image URLs on media attachments. These examples with field expansion so far are not new, however. But as of today, in all versions of the Graph API, we now support this same syntax on write requests. So if you're creating or updating an object, such as our example here where we're writing a new post, you can specify that same fields parameter that's used on the read endpoint. This lets you customize that API response for the write request, and it will contain all of the info you need without needing to have a separate API request. Sometimes, however, this field selection isn't sufficient. You might need to make unrelated read and write requests or specify dependencies between them. And so rather than making these requests one at a time, we also have a general purpose batching API that you can use to combine multiple calls into a single HTTP request. Those will reduce round trip time, which again is especially important for mobile apps. So for example, with YumFresh, let's say we want to allow our customers to leave a comment on a restaurant they recently placed an order with. YumFresh could first call the places graph and search for that restaurant. It can then take the top result from that response and grab its page ID, and then write a new post to that page. With the batch API, we can do all of this in one request. Now, during or after development of your app, you might find bugs in any of our APIs or products, and you should report any bugs you find to us at developers.facebook.com slash bugs. A few years ago, right here at F8, Mark promised that we would close 90% of these bugs in 30 days. And last year, we hit that goal for the first time. We're also thrilled to announce that this year, we've closed over 92% of all developer reported bugs in just 30 days. Our overall bug volume is also down compared to last year, 
just by adding five new developer products and expanding the number of bug categories by over 50%. We're also announcing multi-language support in the bug tool, so you can file bugs and receive responses in languages other than English. As of today, we support Chinese, Japanese, and Korean, but we'll be rolling it out with more languages in the coming months. So to recap what I talked about, we went over our SDKs, how you should use dependency managers to always have the latest versions, and some tips that you can apply to optimize the space used by our SDKs. We went over integrating with Facebook login and our recommendations to limit the amount of information you request up front, and instead ask for that information later on and in context. And I also went over our login security checklist. I then covered what's new in version 2.9 of the Graph API, some improvements we've made to webhooks, and some tips for optimizing your API requests. And we just heard some updates on bug reporting. So that's it for our development best practices, and I'd now like to hand it back over to Claire, who's going to talk about how you can get some of these best practices right from your local community. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Stephen has covered quite a lot of best practices. So how do we get those to you more regularly in the local community that you live in? We have a huge developer community in every corner of the world. By ourselves alone, we won't be able to engage with you and provide those best practices. And we know that you are the expert of, of the platform. And many of you have built amazing experiences using our technology in ways that we can't imagine. So that's why today, we are introducing developer circles. Yi Mei announced this today um, in his keynote. The goal of developer circle is to provide a platform for developers to create active developer communities in your local country and city. We've run this program for, uh, as a pilot for about a year. And so far, we have 23 circles and more than 14,000 members worldwide. And we've seen some amazing stories from these developer circles. I'd like to share one story with you guys. So let's watch the video. Kenapa kok milih teknik informatika? Waktu itu hanya komputer. Ke depan semua teknologi pasti dari situ. Jadi aku sekarang ngajar di kampus Itats. Di situ tuh teknologi Aditama Surabaya. Ya pengen tahu beberapa algoritma yang digunakan di Facebook saya sudah kepoin sudah agak lama. Jadi awalnya memang tahunya dari sosial media ya Facebook. Dari situ ada Jepsi di Malang. Jadi berangkat dari Surabaya menuju ke Malang nyampe ini di Lonya itu tiga jam. Nah kalau dari Facebook ini kan dia men-sharekan salah satu yang uh, mungkin sekarang sedang dikembangkan itu kan juga untuk manfaat banyak orang karena di Desi itu nggak ngelihat sih dia dari komunitas apapun dia mau sebagai pelajar dia mau sebagai profesional dia mau sebagai lecturer kita sama-sama belajar kita sama-sama tumbuh Desi itu Sekarang sih udah banyak 2, 3, 4 kota yang mungkin agak jauh itu bisa saling terkoneksi dengan komunitas Desi yang ada di luar. This is one of the amazing stories that inspired us to open up this pilot to all the developers around the world. And we hope to see a developer circle in every city in the world so that a young woman like her doesn't have to travel three hours to attend a developer circle. So how does it work? Each circle is led by one or multiple local members. And the so-called leads can organize offline events, such as meetups and hackathons, and manage an online group for the community. And the circle leads also get support and resources from the Facebook team. If you're a member of the developer circle, you have access to all of these offline events, as well as the online Facebook group. And in the group, 
you can share resources, best practices with one another. You can also, you can also ask questions and get support from the community and get support from the Facebook team as well. In addition to getting community support, we also partnered with Udacity. Udacity is one of the leading training partners uh, in the world. We partner with them to create custom training programs. And as member of Developer Circles, you will have access to these training programs through the Developer Circle website. So if there's one thing that I would like you to do as you walk out of this session is to join a Developer Circle. Go to developers.facebook.com slash developer circles, enter the city you are from. If there's already a circle, join that circle. If there isn't an existing circle, feel free to start one. And we really hope to see developer circles in every corner of the world. So it's time to wrap up. We covered quite a lot today. So we first talked about the mindset, how you expand your mindset from developer's mindset to founder's mindset. Steven covered a bunch of best practices in your development process. And we also touched on developer circles. Hopefully, with some of the information that we share today, we can help you to grow from product builders to business builders to even community builders in where we are from. Thank you for coming. And please don't forget to go to our booth at the Developer Garage. Thank you. Thank you.